In today's show, Nate Duncan of the Dunked On Basketball Podcast joins the program and we look at the Blazers, their present, their future, and what's next for them. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trail Blazers, your daily Portland Trail Blazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trail Blazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You are listening to another episode of Locked on Blazers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making the show your first listen, coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. So make it a part of your daily routine, make it your first listen, tell your friends to do the same. It's Locked on Blazers, your team every day. Today's episode, a very special one. We are joined by friend of the program and Portland Generals enthusiast, Nate Duncan. Nate, how you doing, man? <laughs> Couldn't be better. Yeah. Do people locally know who the Portland Generals are? Uh, the real hoop heads know that Portland Generals legend Peyton Pritchard is going to be in the building at the Moda Center tonight uh, to where he where he made a name for himself. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Portland Generals are the team that is cobbled together to play practice games against uh, the Hoop Summit team. So like the the sort of best prospects heading into their senior year of, of college come to town every year and they play a like a, a game in front of a ton of NBA scouts, right? Like it's a, it's a big gym. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, no, it's, it is. Yeah. And slowly has become more serious, like the Portland Generals, they take it more seriously and they get they put together a pretty good team. Uh, but it, it, it's famously Peyton Pritchard of West Lynn came and was like really good in the gym. I was like, oh, this dude's probably going to be a high level college basketball player when he was maybe a, a 16, 17 year old. Yeah, a lot of good uh, alums, Paolo Bancaro and... Jaden McDaniels, Steve Blake, after he retired, played. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Thirty-five year old Steve Blake. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, if, if you if you if you're in the area, Steve Blake lived in West Lynn, I believe, after he retired. Uh, ben Carroll and, and then McDaniels are from the Seattle area. If you're in the Northwest, you want to play in the Hoop Summit, hit up my man Reggie. Um, Reggie will get you, Reggie will get you in the game. Um, Nate. I want to talk to you sort of about big picture Blazer stuff today. What do you make of their season so far? Like where are they, you know, where, with where they are now, what do you make of what, what they've done this year? I view it as kind of a failure, not because of the one loss record. I think they've actually been on the rare occasions that they are healthy, more competitive than might've been expected, uh, particularly sure. on defense, but you just look at the games played. Uh, it just, uh, and not really getting a chance to see these guys together. You know, yeah. Shaden Sharp, 32 games. Anthony Simons, 40 games. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon, all right, you maybe didn't expect him to play that much. So that's fine. Scoot Henderson, 44 games, but it's been so disjointed for him. Only yeah. 16 starts for him. So they really have just had uh, Robert Williams, six games. Uh, he was one of the guys that was supposed to actually be really interesting in that trade for uh, Drew Holiday. So there that's really to me just the lack of information and perhaps also the lack of development due to injury is the dominant theme of this Blazer season. Yeah, the the big number for me is 320 minutes. That's how many minutes Shaden Sharp and Scoot Henderson played together this year. It's just not enough yeah. to know anything. It's not enough to know anything. And and you were this like, I think the record is about what we thought. They're probably, made, I think you, when I was on your show at the beginning of the year, I think you had them at 24 wins and I had them, I'm a homer. I had them all the way up at 28. Um, but uh, like, you know, they're going to win 23 games-ish, uh, some, somewhere in that range. Maybe, you know, maybe they get hot, win 26. But like, uh, the record is the record. Like, I, I think that's un sort of unsurprising, but just the lack, like you said, the lack of data collection. This year was supposed to be about figuring out what works, what doesn't and move on. And it's like, Nah. like what what have, what do they know like what do they know about their youngsters what do they know about the shade and sharp pairing and with scoot what do they even know about scoot and amphrey simons playing together you know like that's i think it maybe isn't super appealing to build another team with an undersized shooting guard moving forward in this part of the world but um if they were going to do it they don't even have a ton of data to suggest how that works um what have you made of Scoot season so far? You were pretty high on Scoot coming out of the draft what have, what have you thought about him obviously the the availability has been has been a problem yeah, defensively, I think he's been kind of above your expectations for a 19, 20-year-old point guard. But as I always like to say with these high draft picks, if the best thing that they've done is their defense relative to expectations, that's probably not looking great when you're talking about a, a rookie point guard. 
know, certainly there have been a few flashes, but overall, not as many as I would have hoped. You would hope that he was going to come in and be a fixture on the nightly highlight show. Like that hasn't necessarily happened. And sure, the numbers are rough. You wish that he was shooting better than 41% from two. And the finishing has been a real struggle. He's played a lot of his games with a lot of injuries in the front court or with you know, not much shooting with Thibel and Kamara. And, you know, it hasn't been a great ecosystem. Like ayton has been in and out of the lineup too. It hasn't had Rob Williams as a, a role man. So certainly there are many reasons you can point to, to where you're not going to just cross off those higher end outcomes, but certainly relative to what you would have hoped to, from him, what I would have hoped from him this uh, season is a disappointment when he's been on the floor even if there are reasons you can point to where, you know, at least he hasn't played. If he played every single game and played like this, maybe you would feel even worse. Right. <laughs> but uh, it's still, yeah, it, there are just haven't been as many of these explosive moments. And then, you know, the shot has been probably worse than you might have hoped that it would be uh, for a guy who wasn't like a horrible shooter in the G League. So, yeah, it, uh, disappointing, I think, is the only way to describe it. Are you more concerned about the outside shooting or the layups? Well, so the two things that improve the most for young guards are finishing at the rim and uh, not turning it over as much. Yeah. yeah. So, and he actually, let me see if I if this is correct. Yeah, he hasn't turned it over like a crazy, crazy amount. Eh, I guess 2.9 in 27 minutes yeah I, I realize he hasn't played that many minutes so yeah it's a, a typical high rookie point guard turnover rate so i think that's something that's going to get better i mean he's still with the big hands with the long arms you know, he's still a plus athlete if maybe not like a nuclear athlete at that position yeah so i i think and also you would have to imagine a lot of these games he hasn't been feeling totally right physically will he ever get there maybe is another question but no i i think those are things that are going to improve i i would say actually probably my biggest concern would not be either of those two uh, and i think the shooting will come along to be adequate enough if the getting to the basket and passing also work i think the passing has been solid uh, yeah. the biggest yeah. thing to me would be that i just thought he would be like a more dominating force like getting separation and getting to the basket like that's yeah that's the biggest thing that i was hoping to see where he's just breaking guys' ankles and exploding past people. And that is that is the thing where I'm like, all right, maybe he's just not quite the level of athlete that we thought he was, um, at, at least in that respect. So that would probably be my biggest source of concern. And it's more like, it's not that I don't think any of these things can't get better. It's just that there's a lot of things that happen. Yeah, it's like a lot. He, he, yeah. Right. Like he hasn't, there's no real bread and butter at this point, I would say his bread and butter is starting to look like being someone who gets to the free throw line. He's been, yeah. um, he's been per 36 on the year. He's like four and a half free throw attempts um, for a, for a team. That's pretty pre, for a team with twelve. he has 12 dunks. He has, it's, that's like the really remarkable number, 12 dunks in 44 games. Um, I thought that was going to be way higher, but even in the like, you know, there's sort of, he started the year so bad. It's like, he was so bad sure. for his first five games. So it's like, if you kind of, um, you, you do what you do and just say, okay, the bad games don't matter. We, we ignore the really awful games, but even recently he's up over five free throw attempts per game. Like he's been, he's been better in 2024. Um, I think that's probably his most, to me, that is the skill that I feel, um, most hopeful about. It's like, oh, someone who, Someone who gets free throw attempts at his age is like it, that has real value, particularly for someone who's not a great shooter um, from the outside, even though he's been way better off the dribble as a shooter than as a catch and shoot guy, which um, if you have to have the ball in your hands and you turn the ball over a little bit too much, that's a problem. But um, he'll, you know, he's 19. You kind of, you have to, you either have to be patient or you have to quit already. Um, I think the free throws are, they make me feel, have I, I have some sort of, hope in that in that regard but yeah i think um i think the biggest issue is what you said it's just there's a lot of boxes to tick if it was like well if he improves the shooter he's this but he's got to make layups um he was shooting you know 45 percent at the rim for a big chunk of his career which is or to begin the season that's that's he's just he just has to make more easy ones so uh if he can get there then i think that kind of changes the calculation 
Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's what brings home a winning trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks to exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts to choose from for your ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, baby. Not cash. With all the parts you need and all the parts you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right. Let's get back into the rest of my conversation with Nate Duncan. What have you made of DeAndre Ayton's season? Um, he he was having the worst. He was having the worst year of his career, and now he looks like... Um, so at least like the DeAndre Ayton of your uh, recently. What what have you made of his year? Yeah, I just it, it seemed like there's a uh, idea that they're going to rehabilitate him to some degree, and instead he's mostly gone backwards. And yeah. I think the biggest if you're going to acquire him with that salary, Really, what you're hoping for is that you can run some stuff through him, that he's not going to be just a play finisher. And if anything, he's probably been worse as a post-up guy than he was in Phoenix. In Phoenix, at least, you know, you had a little more spacing. You had yeah. Chris Paul getting the ball on a deep seal where he could just turn with that Knight's touch. It didn't matter as much that he didn't get to the foul line because he was shooting 70% from the field or whatever it was. And he was just getting the ball and able to just shoot it immediately. and uh, because he had the good touch, uh, he was a really efficient option. He was able to generate a fair number of shots that way. But yeah, the complete, I mean, I never was a believer in this, but clearly <laughs> if you are acquiring him, making the money that he's making on basically just a straight swap, right? Uh, yeah. They did get Kamara in that deal too, which... You know, yeah, think, Kamara is useful. He looks like a useful player. Yeah. Yeah, but he's he's not... Acquiring him isn't worth having to pay DeAndre Ayton $35 million a year. <laughs> I would say. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's looking like a failed gamble so far. I do think he's, you know, he hasn't been bad defensively. To the yeah, I, I think, to, to my, to, from my eye, I think he's been better defensively than I thought he would be. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I kind of was a pretty big doubter in his defensive impact. And I think he's been kind of totally fine to good on that end for the most part. But, yeah. uh, um, but, but, but again, you know, another, and, and he's also missed uh, some time as well. So I yeah. just I, I think the idea they acquired him with the idea that there was more there, and if anything, there was less. Yeah, he he took his first three pointer of the season uh, over the weekend. It's like this is your chance to spread your wings. You're on the worst offense in the league. Like they desperately need you to do more stuff. Like why not just why not you know be a little more creative with him? Stick him in different you know use Tamari Tamari Kamara as the screener and stick DeAndre Ayton in the corner. Um, you know he's his rim attempts are way down. He is probably on pace though to take more free throws than games played, which was a, for a while there, it was getting a little dicey whether we were going to get one free throw attempt a game, but he's now up to 53 free throw attempts on 41 games. So that's huge. One three pointer attempt now up to over one free throw a game. Like um, a guy who only lives between four feet and 20 feet and nowhere else under any circumstances. Uh, I do think he's been a little bit better since he came back, but the first 25 games of his Blazers tenure was like, Oh, he's as bad as he's worse than he's ever been. So it's hard to ignore that. I, I, I think so much of this with the Blazers season is just like bad ecosystem. But like, they built the roster. Like, you know, they've had a ton of they had a ton of injuries, but they built the roster knowing they were going to be light on shooting. Like that was like a thing from the beginning that they were going to have trouble shooting. So the sort of creativity to get guys in better spaces, and maybe some of it is just like they thought Scoot was going to be better, and he hasn't been, and that is a challenge. So um, I, I kind of wonder, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that all plays into it. Can, can I add another kind of dominant theme of the, of the Blazers season? I please, find please. Kind of, it kind of ties in with what we were first talking about with the injuries is my hope for this season. When you looked at what they got in the Dame trade and the subsequent drew trade was, it might go something like this, right? That, you know, maybe Shaden Sharp starts coming off the bench 
You're starting Simons and Scoot together. All right, that's fine. Scoot and Sharp look so good. They're obviously the future that you feel comfortable trading Anthony Simons at the deadline. You get a really nice haul for him. You get a couple of first-round picks for him. Rob Williams comes back. Maybe he's even vying for the starting center position. He's on a great contract. He's got two, three years left at a very small number. Uh, maybe you either can uh, move him and Aiton is looking like your center of the future. Maybe you can move uh, Robert Williams, get a couple of low firsts uh, for him. Malcolm Brogdon, maybe you get a first for him at the deadline as well. Jeremy Grant, maybe you get like a, another first for him. Maybe you're you you feel all right. You know, great start to the season. Scoot and uh, and Sharp are, are clearly the future. Like Aiton's looking pretty good, and it, Grant doesn't fit our timeline, but we re-signed him, and we're gonna get something positive for him before that contract kind of falls apart. So now we're going into the future with like five more first round picks, and we got our backcourt of the future, and we're getting another high pick this year. And you're feeling like you know the Blazers are kind of in that position of where you know, an Oklahoma City or a Utah have been as one of these teams that just has like, you know, can do basically whatever they want in a trade, or you just have so many bites at the apple for young players that you know eventually some of them are going to hit and you're going to be successful. And instead, I you know, part of this is the decision-making. I would have still tried to move some of those guys at the deadline, frankly. Uh, you, you didn't make any moves at the deadline. You're not plus any further first-round picks. A lot of these assets have depreciated. Uh, and Robert Williams, perhaps most significantly. So we'll see what happens with Brogdon in the off season. So I think you, in addition to the fact that their two biggest guys, Sharp and Henderson haven't performed at the level you would hope, even if they both had flashes, I'm sure we'll talk about Sharp in a second. Like that's disappointing. Like I was like, man, after they got so much in the Dame trade and the Drew trade and just so many of those assets have depreciated now in a, a bad way, I would say. Yeah, what did you make of them not doing anything? Um, well, they they did something. I hated they, it. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, okay, now, yeah. Yeah, but but I, I will say, like, I can't go all in on that take yet because, like, they're still bad, right? Like, they're not going to win too many games that like, with these right, guys. Right. Like, that's going to be a problem. And then also that all their teams just didn't have as much to trade for their guys. You know, like... We were talking about the Lakers, for example, had one pick to trade. They'll have three to trade um, at uh, it, this summer, right? There's a lot of these teams that were kind of impacted, could only trade one pick or zero. Uh, the Suns, for example, will be able to trade two picks this right. offseason, right? Like they're where the 31 opens up, and then maybe you have a 24 that you couldn't have traded until the draft due to the stepping rule. So there are a lot of these teams that are way out picks that maybe could make a move in the future. Um, now, if Dallas had come calling with their 27 pick that they traded for PJ Washington, and maybe, you know, maybe you even could have gotten that uh, 26 Clippers pick uh, as well, or like it's the worst of like the Clippers in Philly, I think. Um, you know, if you, like what they traded for Gafford and PJ Washington, would Dallas have made that available as a package for Jeremy Grant, who's better than th those guys? You know, I would have taken it. It seemed like they just didn't even begin to explore the right, possibility right. of trading him. Certainly never even began to explore the possibility of trading Anthony Simons, who is you know, superfluous in theory if Scoot Henderson and Shaden Sharp are, are your guys. Go like, Anthony Simons only has two years left on his contract. Yeah, clock's ticking on, point, on whether right? you're going to make a move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so, I, so it's not like, oh, yeah, we can, we'll just we're going to just go on with him forever like it's kind of like oh well maybe scoot and Shaden sharp haven't proved yet that we can are good enough to move on for Anthony Simons. it's like well you're fucked if scoot and Shaden sharp aren't good anyway right like Anthony simons isn't like pulling you out of that yawning abyss you might as well get something for him while you can rather than you know re-signing him at another you know 35 million a year after this yeah i i think that's the that's the challenge is they were like i my read on it is they're like Wow, with the young the youngsters, the young guards are so far away. Every time it's only twenty four. We are uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable like choosing them over him. But at some point, that like the decision gets made for you. I think the decision could get made for them as soon as this summer. Where it's just like we have to we have to explore an Amphrey Simons trade because you know we can't we just can't push that far forward where he becomes an expiring and we don't get you know we don't get real value for him.
Yeah. Now, if I if they move these guys in the summer and they get good stuff for them, okay. Like I, I exactly, completely, exactly, yeah. uh, like I, I will rescind this. And, but I do think, and Jeremy Grant, you know, I was worried that like he's been really healthy this year. He continues to shoot it really well from three. You know, I, I was worried that he was maybe a ticking time bomb. Like that's hopefully they're going to make it to the end of the year without him having lost any value. Uh, although, you, you know, if you're trading for him, you don't necessarily, you don't get this year's playoffs, but hopefully you get more. So yeah, that, that was kind of my big takeaway is just that if you look at the cupboard right now, it's, it's pretty bare. Like they're not, they've got one, you know, golden state pick and a couple you know, a Milwaukee first and a Boston first. Like they could have, you were hoping they're going to add a lot more to that and they just haven't yet. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. It's America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on a two to six player entry. It's just you versus the stat projections. Prize Picks sets the, sets the projections and you pick more or less and then you watch those winnings roll in. And right now, it's demon time over on Prize Picks. You can win up to a hundred times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn a hundred dollars into a excuse me, ten dollars into a thousand dollars. That's what a hundred X means. Ten dollars becomes a thousand dollars. Here's how it works: Demons and Goblins, the newest and most exciting way to play Prize Picks. Squares are marked either with a red demon or a green goblin, and they get different payouts. And you can now win up to a hundred times your money as little as just four correct picks if you if you go to the demon squares and the goblin squares so why not go over to pricepicks.com slash locked on nba and use the code locked on nba for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars that's pricepicks.com slash locked on nba and use the promo code locked on nba they'll match you dollar for dollar on your first deposit up to 100 bucks it's prize picks pick more pick less it's that easy Today's show is also brought to you by Robin Hood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robin Hood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robin Hood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from an other from another retirement account with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robin Hood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And more in, now for more legal info, this claim has to be as, Q, as of Q1 2024 validated by Radio global market research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the day of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. Still a pass first point guard, still Mike Richmond. You are still listening to Locked on Blazers. Here's the rest of my conversation with Nate Duncan from the Dunked on Basketball podcast. Do you think um, d- there has been some reporting that they're comfortable kind of like keep they're going the Houston Rockets route and having some vets alongside the youngsters? What do you make of that approach um, in terms of like, let's assume that the vets mean keeping Malcolm Brogdon and Jeremy Grant into next season. Yeah, that would I think that would be foolish, because uh, um, like like where are you I, okay the Houston Rockets right the Houston Rockets don't have their pick that's why they're doing right. this right yeah uh, that's uh, and I mean they've been bad now for a while and that doesn't look good but that's see to me that would make a lot more sense if you had traded all these guys because also now from a PR standpoint. If you want to trade these guys in the off season, it looks worse, right? It's like, hey, all right, we moved to these guys at the deadline. That's fine. You know, we got some expirings or something, or or we got some more matching salary, and now we can make some more moves in the off season, bringing in veterans who are different veterans. But we already got something for these other veterans. Like, it's hard yeah. for me to imagine them moving those guys and then like going to get other veterans immediately. Like that order of operations over the summer doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it's I I'm I'm. I would say very puzzled by it. I don't, I, I'm having trouble seeing the other side of the hill. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned Shane Sharp. Yeah. What, what do you make of his season? He, he was looking like he was going to be, um, 
a relatively interesting part early in the season. Like he had a, a stretch in December where it's like, oh, this dude can play. What, and then he just hasn't been healthy. What do you make of his second year in the league? Yeah, I mean, there were some very interesting starts, admittedly against not great teams, but like the end of the Memphis game at home, yeah. the end of the Detroit game, I think it was on the road, where I think the Memphis game, they were doing more on-ball stuff with him. The Detroit game, they're bringing him off those wide pin downs, and Detroit yep. couldn't guard that, right? Because the, it, when he was hitting that shot, you go under, he's going to bang the three. You trail him, now you got one of the best athletes in the league going downhill. I thought you know some of his finishes where he's taken off He's got stronger, so he was able to get into guys a little bit. When he was finishing well, it looked really good. So you love when a guy is that much of a strategic problem for the other team that they're, okay, all right, you want to try to topside him off that? Well, now you have you know one of the best alley-oop guys in the league going back door, and they're just going to throw it up to the square for him on those plays. So that's to say that like there's he had moments, given his stature in the league, where like teams couldn't guard him at like key moments of the game, like that was really exciting to me. Yep. But obviously the overall statistical resume was rough. Part of that was because there's these moments where he was the only guard available and they had no other shooters at the other positions and he's playing 41 minutes a game. And of course then he injures the groin, then he comes back. I don't know what the local feeling is on whether that situation was mismanaged you know it's well i know that he came like the, some eyebrows. the first game that he was off a of minutes restriction he played 40 minutes into overtime and then he, he was and then he was his season ended within a week so i i don't know but i know that that i know that that's factual like i know that i, I, I know mean, that he was and, yeah 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 I, it's, so it, it's groin city right now too instead of instead yeah. of rip city <laughs> with all these like these core muscle injuries the doctor injuries like that's to, to and yeah i mean to have season ending surgery on, on you know a torn groin after like as a second injury and you know that i think he probably injured himself the first time because it just that i don't know if that was chauncey billups call i don't know if that was the organization's call but just the idea that you would in this completely lost season that you're going to be playing someone like that who doesn't have a lot of experience 41 minutes a game you know, I, I'm sure it's very easy to play a young guy. You think these guys are indestructible. It's just that's, and especially when it's a soft tissue injury like that, you definitely really have to question it, particularly because this Blazers medical staff has had a lot of, and I'm not sure what the continuity has been there with, with that group over the last few years. They, they basically totally, eyebrow raising yeah. Things. They basically changed it, totally rehauled it over the last 12 months. Um, they have a whole new crew. <laughs> they have a whole new crew. <laughs> okay well it's uh maybe they need some more power and maybe, maybe maybe it's more an organizational decision making issue but yeah it's i mean it's the, the the they've they've had undeniable they've had some they've had some injury uh let's call it stuff they've had some stuff where they've where, where there's there's more you know we're talking about health more and like management of health more than than you would want in general um you talked about well, trading so, every time so yeah should we finish up on sharp on sharp though i, I guess he just yeah. uh you know, if you look at uh, Seth Partno puts together some stats for us, one of the things he looks at is contested finishing, 46.5%. That's not amazing for Shaden Sharp. Again, he's bashing his head into the wall. 46% on twos, that's that's not amazing. 33% yeah. on threes, that's not amazing. Uh, the three-point volume, that's not amazing. That's something you and I have talked about in the past as well. So you are still kind of relying on some of these flashes. And you do wonder if, like, all right, is he going to come back and not quite be the same athlete after having, you know, surgery on, on his groin muscle? So it's, again, I was hoping to just see more evolution, like his complete lack of high level experience before coming to the NBA. Just getting more of an understanding of how to execute on both ends is important. And so, like, that to me, that lost information for him, he did end up playing like 1,200 minutes because he was playing a billion minutes in some of these games but that lost information for me that that is you know you look at like where the pistons were with kate cunningham this year right with him having missed kind of all of his second season and right. sharp isn't that level of prospect but you know it really it took a long time for the pistons and for kate cunningham to kind of click in this season and cunningham's starting to play well now but yeah i mean that second year is just so important and to lose that 
and then go into that third year, there's gonna be a lot of pressure on that third year and, and trying to establish yourself for an extension. It's just that, it's, that, yeah, it's that a, particular injury is the most damaging of this Blazer season to me. Yeah. It, it's the money-making year, right? Like th the year three is the money-making year. It's, it's when guys get um, hundreds of millions of dollars or they get 12 more months to make hundreds of millions of dollars. Like it's um, it is, it's a big moment for them. So I wonder like, I think you, you've seen, you know, some flashes from, from Sharp, albeit a, a little bit, but I think he's got, he's got the physical tools to be, to be, to be really good. And he has some moments there when he's been really good. He's probably a two. Um, so he's, you know, I, I, like, yeah, yeah. You don't want him playing the three. Yeah. He's probably a two. Every Simons is, is the odd man out here is what is your sort of. We talked about sort of the other vets. What is your timeline on trading Ant? Like, what do you, what do you do? They do they have to do it this summer? Can they be patient till next deadline? Like, what is if you consider kind of the future is Scoot Henderson, Shane Sharp, even with how little we've learned about them this year? What is kind of their what should their appetite be for shopping Anthony Simons? Yeah, I think they should be doing it at every possible transaction period. Now, if it's like, hey, you're getting some shitty first at the end of the first round, like, yeah, okay, go ahead and, and hold on to him at that point and the type of player that he is i'm not sure that there's a massive market right for right him. you know when we did our mock deadline i was uh, very focused on moving him to orlando i i was the blazers and orlando was interested in getting him because like, he's a pretty solid fit there i would yep. say because he, he's played more point guard this year i think like he can play that in some systems and his ability to shoot the ball off the dribble or off the catch is really good i think he's been not as bad defensively in the last year and a half or so. And certainly in their system with all the other athletes they have, he'd be a good fit. You know, what is Brooklyn interested in him? Like, you know, probably not right. Like there, there aren't that many teams where they're just like, and also like DeJounte Murray is another guy who's going to be out there that, you know, in theory teams would be trying to get. And I think teams might value DeJounte Murray more than times. Eh, I'm not sure I would agree with that necessarily, but so I'm not sure that there are that many opportunities to move him, but I'll, and particularly with Brogdon there too. I mean, that's the other thing where it's like, are right, yeah. you going to have four of these guards? Like now, as it turned out this year, none of them were ever, they never had four. Of them all <laughs> you you four needed Obviously, six. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you know, you do wonder how many minutes Brogdon can play anyway, but it's, I think if there, you certainly, it would be negligent to not at least be gauging the market on him. And if you have an offer that's equivalent to like two major assets, I would move him. Yeah, that's kind of where I land too. Is that it's like it would be malpractice not to make phone calls this summer. Like it would just be it would like because his he's like his market is limited, or maybe he just falls apart on a on a you know or has another kind of injury plagued year and his value goes down as well. I think like there's just to me the risk of not moving guys is one that isn't talked about enough and i yeah. like because like, because it's hard for me to and i do think this summer too it's just easier as i said because it's easier to make transactions in the summer with the rosters with the money more first round picks are available i think a lot of there's a lot of pressure on a lot of teams to win that are going to have assets they're going to move them then everyone's going to be impacted again uh, particularly if some of these are second apron teams like this is the last year that you're not going to have a frozen draft pick if you're in the second right. apron so I, I do think that it would like, all right, maybe if the offer isn't there, the offer isn't there. And maybe they gauged it quietly and we just never heard about it. But right. you know, we hear, we hear about it for most of these guys if the team is gauging the market. And certainly there was never a report on that with Grant or with Simons. Yeah, it seems like they Or really they, even Brogdon, it seemed like. Right. It, the, the reports we heard on Brogdon was the Blazers are not going to trade him. It was like all of a sudden it was like, so it seems like teams have called and the Blazers are not moving forward. Maybe it was Brogdon's injury. Like maybe it was health, you know, maybe because yeah. he's out I with mean, the elbow tendonitis. played yeah. since then, right? Yeah. Yeah. He and actually now, is. That also torpedoed a, a, a trade over the offseason, too. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, um, it makes it relatively tricky uh, going forward. They, the Blazers have to do something, though. They have 14 players on the roster, and they're, like, right up against the tax line. Like, they, they're oh, going they, to... Yeah, that was the that was the other thing that I was, like, surprised by. It's like, yeah, like, you you have to move these guys in the summer. Some of it, somebody's going to yeah, have to Yeah, somebody has to go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
uh, that that makes it really tricky. So then you now you're kind of negotiating from a point where they're like, well, you, we know you need to save money, and that kind of changes it. Where if you had just gotten some expirings, it would be a little bit simpler going forward. Um, let's let's end with the most exciting player in the Blazers roster by far. Uh, the Blazers got Delano Banton for a second round pick that's very unlikely to convey. He took 27 shots on Friday, which is pretty incredible. Um, I never thought I would be in, uh, able to uh, you know, have the opportunity to watch Delano Banton take 27 shots, but he's been pretty good for the Blazers. He's certainly been the best he's ever been in a Blazers uniform. What do you make of, uh, of the young guard wing in Banton from what you've seen in his uh, short Blazers career? Yeah, the shot looks pretty good. I mean, that's the number one takeaway because that was always yep. what was was holding him back and you know th that shot he hit the ice game the other day that little like pick and pop uh is i mean that's the first uh, first synergy that's the first like uh pick and roll roll man shot <laughs> that he's hit as a blazer but let's go uh, like, man, here you go yeah it, it, you know he hit another one off a handoff like it's it's looking like he can at least be a threat out there and defensively he's got pretty good size it's not great getting over screens but maybe he can do some switching and they have a lot of guys who can do that uh, it's a solid rebounder, so he can grab it and push the ball. Just, you know, not an amazing athlete. You know, his, like, getting downhill, he's not someone who probably scares you that much. But he can make some decisions. He can pass. And, you know, certainly someone that, you know, maybe he's not, if the shot continues to go well, still probably not a starting level of player. You know, because right. he's not really going to be, like, I don't know what he does in the pick and roll that really scares you defensively. Like, I don't think he's going to be a guy who's like, oh, you go under on him. Like, we can't even do that, right? Like, that's, yeah. you know, I think if he's, you're playing the pick and roll two on two, like, I don't know that he's like some huge threat and, and you're that worried about getting out of your base coverage on him or something. But yeah, they do have a team option on him for next year. Uh, and the, and that team option is only uh, $200,000 guaranteed. So you imagine that they will pick that up or maybe they decline that and that could be, because they have that team option, that could be leveraged to get him on a longer term deal. Right, uh, he would be unrestricted were they to decline that. So, I, like, it certainly looked like uh, someone they should keep around and see if he can be, you know, a backup wing, backup guard. Particularly if uh, they move on from some of the guys we're we're talking about, you know, maybe he could be one of these guys who's like a third guard with size, can play next to either sharp or henderson like that that would be your hope for what could come about and maybe you know or maybe you could play a little bit of three as well for you give you some additional ball handling yeah i think he's better as a two i i, I think the strength matters for him on defense from what the little i you know he's played like 14 games or 12 games with the blazers so but i think the when he has He's okay in like little switchy moments but if he if he's like okay go guard a big wing it's not um not ideal but yeah, I think if if the if they didn't have 14 players under contract for next year, I think it'd be a no brainer. Like he can be part of the plan. They just have a lot of decisions to make, and if and I don't know if Delano gets caught in those like in the in the churn of of all the decisions they have to make. We trade in Brogdon for for stuff for guys who uh, you don't have a 20 million dollar. There's no 20 million dollar magic eraser in the summertime. When you if you even if you get off him, you're going to get players player or player back so um they they just have they have some roster decisions to make and i think banton is like a i think he's been intriguing and fun i've enjoyed i've enjoyed the delano banton experience but i'm not i, I i'm not 100 sure he can be he will be part of the plan just because of all the other dominoes that have to fall first yeah. well, well we'll see what happens the rest of the way right if he could if he you know shoots 27 percent on threes the rest of the way then maybe not but but i mean the other thing is you know he's two hundred thousand dollars guaranteed next year right? yeah. i mean why wouldn't you just extra worst case exercise that team option and bring them in and see uh you know you could always just cut him like that two hundred thousand, right there. exactly I yeah make a decision in be, yeah yeah make yeah, a decision in january be, yeah. otherwise yeah exactly yeah yeah seems seems reasonable all right nate thank you so much uh when if folks are looking for more of you where can they find you yeah uh nate duncan mba is uh my i still will say twitter because x just, you could say twitter we're okay. We're okay sense. with that here. And and uh, yeah, we we have dunked on Prime five days a, a week with me and Danny Larue, and one day a week with uh, erstwhile Portlinian. Port is that what you say? What, what do you what Portlander? I think Portlander. Portlander. Yeah. John Hollinger, and also we do the NBA strategy stream once a week. If you're a League Pass subscriber, and we try to really like get into the weeds 
as we're doing the call, like really lock in on every play during those matchups. So that that's kind of a fun thing if you're a total hoop nerd to check out just on the NBA League Pass app. You click on streams and we'll be one of them. Uh, we're doing, who are we doing tomorrow? We'll probably figure that out. We Oh, we're doing uh, Rockets and Spurs tomorrow. So hopefully Wembenyama will play. If you want to check that game out, a lot of young, interesting players, you can join us for that. <laughs> Or, or a lot of Zach Collins, if you're a Blazer fan. Uh, maybe just like a little too much Zach Collins. Uh, Nate, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I I, I appreciate the time. Uh, listeners, come back tomorrow. We do five days a week wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Tell your friends about the program. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.